and stocks plunging again. The Dow dropping 1,338 points to under 20,000. That wipes out all the gains since the election. Trading was temporarily halted as markets fell 7% in the afternoon. Let's put this move into context from the top. It took the Dow average 103 years to first hit 10,000. It took it fewer than 30 days to lose 10,000 points. Let's talk more about all of this with Kyle Bass. He is founder and CIO of Heyman Capital Management. He also, of course, called the subprime crisis, been active out there talking about China as well. Kyle, we do appreciate you joining us uh, exclusively here on CBC. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any re you're a guy that made his living and made his money uh, watching the markets go down, but you are a fan of this country. Do you see any reason to be optimistic in any way right now? <laughs> well, thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me on. It's good, good talking with you. I Look, I think that one thing the president uh, and, his, and the administration, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, that, uh, have done that has really impressed me is, you know, look, we got the, this bill, this $1.3 trillion spending bill through the House, through the Senate this afternoon in a 90 to 8 uh, uh, vote. And we're talking about $1.3 trillion. If you think back to the financial crisis, it took a long time. Uh, it took months to get everyone on board with TARP. Uh, and then uh, expanding TARP's capacity took many different inputs from many different players, the president, the treasury secretary, and Congress. And here here we've, we've actually moved some spending bills through in light speed as far as Washington's concerned. Uh, so you have the Treasury guaranteeing money market funds. You have uh, the commercial paper facility in place. You have $150 billion going to distressed industries, $50 billion going to airlines. It, that's impressive, Brian. But I think what's most important, uh, I think, to the people of the United States is, you know, these things do happen. Things like this Chinese virus come into the world and they ravage the world and then they leave. We develop some sort of herd immunity. Again, I'm not a doctor, but I've read enough white papers on this to be just slightly you must, dangerous. Kyle, you must have read the same paper that I read last night or two nights ago where they talked about that new concept of herd, H-E-R-D, immunity uh, and basically building up that thing. L listen, I, I, we've never had it happen in our lifetimes. The Hong Kong flu, the last real big one, was 1968 and 69. Before that, you got to really go back to 1918, 1919. So mm -hmm. obviously neither of us knows what's going to happen. But from a financial perspective, it sounds like you're thinking the government, you know, whether we can be critical here or there, is doing the right things quickly. Yeah, I mean, look, whether or not whether or not the administration took this seriously enough in the first couple of weeks, you know, that's, that, that's neither here nor there anymore. Here we are today. They're, they're pushing through things. Both Democrats and Republicans are uniting. One of the things that United States does best is we all come together in crisis and we work hard to get through it. And we're getting through it. And, you know, I heard some other uh, commentators on your show uh, earlier today talk about, you know, we're not the I don't think the government's asking people to send their kids to distant battlefields to, to fight in kinetic wars. They're asking everyone to stay home for a month. I, I, I think everyone can pull that off. And for the people that are laid off and, and live paycheck to paycheck, these spending bills should help uh, the rent abatements and the mortgage payment uh, of uh, deferrals should definitely help. Now, they're not going to be able to help every single person, but they're doing a hell of a job very quickly to help. The other thing that's going on, Brian, is if you read enough white papers, you see there are drugs out there that have worked, that have worked to help head off the duration and severity of, of this Chinese virus. And yeah. One of them uh, is, is one called chloroquine phosphate, and that's something that South Korea used to, to really blunt the, the growth of that, uh, the disease over there. China's using it. It's in, it's in white papers from Pakistan to China to South Korea to now in the United States and Canada. You know, this is a, an anti-malarial drug that already has FDA approval. I think we'll see that rolled out soon. I think that Gilead has a very promising drug out there uh, that's showing in clinical trials to be very very effective if, if, if it's caught early uh, to, to uh, lessen the symptoms. So when I look at this, whether this takes two months, three months, or four months, whatever the number is, uh, till we see peak deaths and then, and then a, a, a curve on the, on the downside, you know, the way that the market is, is trading today, whether you're looking at uh, cruise line, cruise stocks or airline stocks or 
uh, hospitality, all the hotel and motel stocks, and then and then our energy business is also under attack, you yep. know, by Ru- by Russia and Saudi Arabia. It's all happening at the same time, and I think uh, it feels to me like the panic is so much larger than it was in the financial crisis of 2008, and I think calmer heads will prevail. Uh, and I think the prices that are some of these things yeah. are transacting at today are are going to be literally uh, buys of a lifetime and, for our generation. And the one thing that you highlighted in 06 and 07, Kyle, was that there were underlying structural problems in the credit markets, in the financial markets, and in the banks. When you look at it, do you see those same things today? Or is this an income statement problem, not a balance sheet problem? Yeah, the most fascinating thing about today as, as compared to the financial crisis is back in 2008, the, the banks were the center of the problem. And today, the banks are actually the center of the solution. The banks are very well capitalized today. Uh, we essentially re-equitized our entire banking system. Uh, in 2008, we had about a trillion of equity with about 17 trillion of assets in our banks. We pumped in almost $800 billion into the equity of our banks. And we, we, the United States, have the strongest banking system in the world. Europe, on the other hand, never recapitalized its banks, and they're in real trouble. And China's banks and Hong Kong's banks have yet to uh, be completely recapitalized. I think this crisis will force it. So you're going to see banking crises in Europe. You're going to see banking crises in Hong Kong and China. And the U.S. is going to be the anchor for the world this time. And that's why you believe, and I'll reiterate what you said, because I kind of jumped on top of you there, that there will be things that are buying opportunities of a lifetime out of this. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, look, the the market has, has done some uh, it, it was the biggest bull market, the longest running bull market in U.S. history prior to uh, the the Wuhan virus uh, really attacking our marketplace, uh, both literally and figuratively. Uh, and now it's created uh, dislocations in many, many, many different uh, companies that I think will be rectified on the back end. And again, I don't know how long it's going to take, but there are some really, just really interesting, you know, you, are, you can actually be a value buyer once again. I, I, I forgot what they look like in the last decade. There was a, st- I'm not going to ask you to come in individual stocks. There was a stock we could throw up called MFA. It's a REIT. I really hadn't heard of it before today. The stock fell 55% today. It's a mortgage-backed trader. When you look at the housing market and some of the, the MBS stuff that we talked about so much 12 and 13 years ago together, any similarities in any way? On, I mean, is this going to shut down housing? Or do you think the credit markets will still be open enough that people are while reluctant to maybe go to an open house, we'll buy a home. You know, I, I think with rates back to zero uh, and on the backside of this crisis, a, look, what's likely to happen if you just look forward, again, across the maybe the Grand Canyon of, of, uh, of, of, a, of a down move, um, what you're going to see, you're going to see zero rates. You're going to see enormous amounts of liquidity from the, all of the world's central banks. And um, I think they're going to let the economy's uh, inflation is going to run hot. Uh, and I think that's going to be a, uh, a really interesting housing market at that moment in time, i.e., I don't expect house prices to drop much, if any, uh, in the U.S. I say if any. They'll probably drop a little bit on the front end. Uh, but with zero rates and really cheap mortgages and a lot of liquidity on the back end of the crisis and everyone getting back to work, there'll be a real big surge. And um, it, look, it, it, when you think about the way the world's set up today, I always ask people, they say, well, wh- why wouldn't you just go to cash is what they ask me. And I say, well, where else are you going to put your money? You're going to put your money in Europe where the banks are, are woefully undercapitalized. You're going to put your money in China that rules by law instead of a rule of law. You can put your money in Hong Kong where the banking sector is 900 percent of its GDP. There is no better place to put your money than the United States. And there's no better place to put your money in U.S. companies that are that are going to make it through this. Now, look, there's some companies that are going to get leveled by this crisis, right? Companies that were over levered or as we see, look, if you're running an airline and you have your, your cost structure and your whole cost structure is unionized, you have the pilots, you have the flight attendants, you have the, you have the, worker, the, uh, uh, the gate workers, yeah. and then you've got all the slots you have to pay for and all of your equipment that you, de- that you probably have leased and have lease payments to make. And if you have zero revenue for a month or two, 
you're completely insolvent. So that's why the airlines are immediately asking for $50 billion, and, and maybe rightly so. Now, whether or not they spent $55 billion over the last 10 years buying back their stock, maybe we don't allow airlines to buy back their stock after we lend them money. Who knows? I don't know how that goes. But there are a number of things that we can do in these loans from a governance perspective that will make our country stronger over time. I hope so. And I think I think the one that we do need to do, too, though, is just let's just call it COVID-19, not Wuhan or China or, you know, coronavirus. Let's call it the COVID-19, Kyle. That, I think that'll bring us all together. Can we do that? Come up with a common name? You know, Brian, I'll agree with you on a lot of things, but, you know, changing the, the naming convention for viruses that's, that's gone on for the last hundred years, the point of origin has always helped people understand which virus it is. And the Chinese Communist Party has asked the world or actually really propagandized the world with this COVID-19. If we start naming diseases after numbers, uh, we're never going to remember what kind of disease it is. I understand. This, this, I just I this, want to make sure we don't make it. We, we don't take it to a country level. You know what I mean? Because this is the global fight. You would agree with that, right? You know, we call things West Nile virus. Why don't we call it the Wuhan flu? You know, we can call it whatever we want to call it. I'm not going to call it what the Chinese government wants me to call it.